everybody. Hello, um, I'm Richard Thomas. I'm chairman of the Guernsey Data Protection Authority. And I'm joined today, um, April the uh, 19th, by Professor Christopher Hodges, who is Professor of Justice Systems at the University of Oxford. And uh, Chris has researched and written extensively about what works and what doesn't work um, with regulation, looking well beyond the, uh, the black letter of the law and looking into actual corporate uh, culture, corporate behavior and so on. Well, Chris, welcome very much to this conversation. Um, as you know, our project Bijou in Guernsey is based upon culture and behavior. Uh, can I start by asking you to summarize, why do you think organizations comply with the law? In very simple terms, uh, because they want to. Um, and one looks at, for example, non-compliant organizations, which are criminal organizations like the Mafia. Um, they don't want to. Whereas most organizations are, are full of people who, um, who do actually want to be normal members of society and, and do want to comply. So, and the law is only a statement of what society expects of people, basically, in very simplistic terms. So it's really about motivation and resource and competence and understanding and training and then appropriate systems. Okay. And uh, what, what, what are the main sort of cultural, the drivers of cultural and behavioural change inside an organisation? Let's say that they, they know they're not quite getting it right. What drives good behaviour and good compliance with the law? What role does the leadership play uh, in this process? Um, it, it's quite instructive to think about, for example, small businesses, SMEs. Because when they start, start off, they're basically, they've got a very good idea. They've got a driving idea, a mission. Um, or, you know, farmers, for example. Um, but they're very busy. They've got to think about what is really important to them. And that means that they can't necessarily uh, have resource or understanding or, as it were, quote, compliance about everything that's going on. So it's partly to do with with developing a broader understanding and having um, drivers of culture like leadership commitment, but actually thinking more widely about what they should be doing um, and moving into something which is more mature and, and broader. Okay. And uh, I mean, you've researched many, many areas, uh, financial services, uh, civil aviation, uh, health and safety in the workplace. I mean, do you think there's anything different in the data protection field? Um, broadly speaking, as far as culture is concerned, the answer is no, um, because we're, well, any business as well as any individual has got an awful lot of things to think about at once. Um, and society expects us to do the right thing holistically. Um, data protection, as well as uh, modern digital regulation and AI and online arms and all this sort of stuff, um, are just new things to think about. So <laughs> there is more to think about. But the, the question is, do we want to do the right thing? And the reason why we're talking about culture is because the traditional model of enforcing law, enforcing rules, which is to do with inspection, identifying breaches, imposing sanctions, and then assuming that everything will be wonderful and every, everyone will comply all the time, has a lot of drawbacks to it. <laughs> Some people would say it just doesn't work. Whereas if we think more holistically about trying to do the right thing, you automatically start looking at an organizational culture. And is, is it thinking about doing everything? Is it thinking about get, having the right approach to data? and thinking about the fact that it's other people's data. Um, so it's a, it's a broader aspect and opening out, therefore, of, of culture. And so what you're really saying is that this has massive implications for regulatory bodies, such as the Data Protection Authority in Guernsey or anywhere else in the world. So the, the implications, I mean, you know, you looked at psychology, you looked at the uh, substance of a law and processes and behaviours, as you mentioned, but how can a regulatory body really maximize uh, its effectiveness? Um, I think there are a number of things a regulatory body can do. 
Um, the first is, is to understand where, where businesses are coming from and how mature they are. And that means segmenting um, the marketplace, if you like. Um, you, there are a lot of discussions going on at the moment about saying, well, for SMEs, they actually need support. Uh, if, if you use enforcement tools, they're just not going to improve. Uh, you might be enforcing the law much, but if one's thinking about the position of the of the businesses and getting them to improve, it's a, it's a different approach. So uh, with more mature businesses, it's a reminder about saying, have you got systems that will deal with data protection? Um, have you have you got the right codes, the, the sort of ethical approaches? Have have you as a regulatory authority got a large toolbox? of different tools um, which you can deploy in dealing with different people from at one end talking to people to saying please please think about this and please do this differently to the other criminal end which says we need to stop these people impose significant penalties stop their businesses etc cetera, etc cetera. now in between there's an enormous amount so the question of what are we really dealing with it needs quite a sophisticated approach but of course, it's a two-way process. So the businesses need to um, engage in those conversations uh, sensibly. And I, I think every regulatory authority in every sector I know is involved in this sort of transformation on both sides at the moment. And in some, it's easier than others. Um, but it's but it's an approach of everyone thinking, actually, we're all involved in stakeholder issues. Uh, rather than just making money on the company side. So let's think about this approach. Okay, and uh, obviously there are examples in different parts of the world, regulatory bodies, where they have gone down this road rather than the old fashioned sort of inspection, deter and punish approach. And can you give a, an example which you've come across where this appears to be working? Yes, well, there are, there are fortunately quite a few which are really quite encouraging. Um, there was a very interesting pilot that, that um, some colleagues of mine did a couple of years ago involving uh, Cornwall County Council, for example, and the food business. Um, both sides got together and talked about what they were doing, how they were engaging um, and trusting each other. And both sides were very happy with the result. They were solving more problems together um, as, a, as, a, as a general issue. Now, um, equally, there's another example um, that, that uh, has recently gone public with setting water prices in Scotland by their regulator called the Water Industry Commission for Scotland and um, the main undertaking called Scottish Water. Now that's a fairly straightforward situation because you've only got one regulator and one company, broadly speaking, the industry's structure is a bit more complicated. But they both sort of got together and said, what are we trying to do? What are our purposes? Are they shared? Let's be ethical about this. Let's have a, um, a shared understanding of how we're going to do it. Let's get all the information on the table and talk about it. So the discussions moved more quickly. They identified problems on both sides, um, some of which had been in the too difficult box previously because they hadn't necessarily wanted to confront them. Um, but as soon as you get all this on the table, it's a shared problem. Now, there are other discussions. I, this morning, I was involved in a very long discussion with the food industry globally about how this is moving. And um, there are discussions, as you said, in financial services, which is quite difficult, quite challenging, um, or, or the energy sector or whatever. But the basic approach is to think about, let's, this is a shared issue. What are the purposes? Are they shared? What are the ethical approaches? Do we need an ethical code, for example, which is almost sort of replacing that certainly perhaps on top of some of the legal requirements um, for how people are going to do things? And one of the points might be, if you've got a problem, talk about it rather than just hide it or think it's too difficult. Talk, talk to the regulator or whoever. Um, and um, there are various tools which are available. There is a regulatory delivery model, which um, is a, a book called Regulatory Delivery, which was written by um, largely by regulators themselves about saying what should our regulator uh, structure look like. Um, and we've also written a book on ethical business practice and ethical business regulation as a model. 
um, which is backed up by an enormous amount of, of sociology and psychology, as you say, and I'm, I'm still researching this, but it, but it, it's very strongly science based. But how, how, how does, a, how do regulatory bodies uh, distinguish, you talk about segmentation, but how do you distinguish between those who are trying to get it right? What sort of indicators can a body go for in terms of uh, knowing that these guys are trying to get it right, as opposed to these guys who you know, perhaps don't give a toss about the law. What sort of evidence yes. would you suggest should be taken into account? Um, well, there is no single answer to that. It depends on the situation and the level of maturity and development on, on both sides. But if one goes back to first principles, and this is from philosophy, um, it's, the, the relationship should be based on trust and observance of ethical rules and values. So trust is based on evidence. What is the evidence? You build up the evidence that you can be trusted over time. Now, some of this is uh, just sort of classical approach of having a compliance system and operating it, et cetera. You would add in uh, what, how has, uh, has the organization responded when things go wrong? It is not a problem if things go wrong, if you break the rules or whatever. The problem is, how do you respond to it? That demonstrates whether you're ethical or not. Did you hide it? Did you say, we need to improve? What is the answer? And talk to people about it and say, what should we do in these circumstances? Should we put everything right? Should we, with various forms of redress or compensation, or but really improving the system, working the system? All that is evidence of a culture that is trying to improve and trying to do the right thing in what can be a very complex world. Well, look, Chris, so we could talk for two hours about all this or two days, but we've covered law, justice, psychology, sociology, ethics, huge amount. And uh, I think we're very grateful to you for sharing some of these thoughts. I get out of this the importance of segmentation, the importance of dialogue, the importance of trusting those you can trust, but making sure we know the motives and the behavior and the culture inside the organization being regulated. And I think that you are saying that data protection is no different from anything else. Chris Hodges, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Richard. It's been a great pleasure.